Our gospel reading comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 22, beginning with verse 34, and it reads, Hearing that Jesus silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together, and one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment of, the, of them all? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, the Lord is, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until your enemies are under my, your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Today's sermon is entitled, Living God's Greatest Commandment. I have a question that I want you to listen to, but then tuck it in the back of your mind as we go through this sermon. And that question is simply this, how do we live God's greatest commandments. To answer this question, I want you to put on your imaginary walking shoes and come with me on a journey, a journey that will begin in Egypt, and it's going to end with our gospel reading, with Jesus telling us to live our lives in accordance to the greatest commandment. So everybody put on your walking shoes and let's get ready to go. The journey begins because God heard the prayers and the pleas of the people of Israel who were being oppressed and just simply treated badly at the hands of the Egyptians. Upon sending Moses to lead them out, we quickly learned that the people of Israel don't have a relationship with God at that point in time. They know God because of the stories that were told them and passed on from their parents and grandparents, but they don't know God personally at this particular point in time. At this point in the journey, as strange as it may sound, the people of Israel who were living in Egypt knew more about the gods of the Egyptians than they did about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But nevertheless, there was one thing that they did remember, and that was they knew enough of their history to know that when their ancestors were in trouble, they prayed to God, and God got them out. And so, as they looked at the situations they were facing and the moments that they were going through and the times and the trials and their tribulations, they did what their forefathers and foremothers did. They prayed. And God heard their prayers and again sent them Moses. And at this point, when God answered their prayers, God put in motion something that would help them to learn more about who he was and also 
to help them to learn to trust him unconditionally. And so after Moses performed a number of miraculous signs, God led the people of Israel out of Egypt to claim a place that they can call home, to claim a place that they would say is their home. And this place was lovingly referred to as the promised land. And so as they left Egypt and their journey took them closer and closer to the promised land, God made another observation. He realized that the people of Israel were plagued with challenges that revolved around relationships. They didn't have a good relationship with God, but he also noticed that they didn't have a good relationship with each other. And it was with that that somewhere along the journey, God decided to give them something, a set of rules, to help them to sort this out. And that set of rules, as we know it, is called the Ten Commandments. Now, I went through my lesson with the children a little while ago, and I figured they're still in their learning phase, so I'll let them slide on this one. But you all have been around for a little while, and so I should probably point out that I, I'll just point to like 10 of you and say, what's the first commandment? What's the second commandment? What's the third commandment? How many of you think is a good idea to do that? I see every, no, okay, right. And then the people on the uh, Zoom, they get a break because if I point to them, they can quick run look it up. I'll tell you what the Ten Commandments were. The first four talked about God and his relationship with us. And the first one, of course, was you shall have no other gods before me. The second one, you shall not make any image in the form of anything in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord, am a jealous God. The third one, you shall not misuse my name. The fourth one, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, etc. The fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother so that they may live long in the land the Lord your God is given you. Number six, you shall not murder. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Number eight, you shall not steal. Number nine, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. And then number 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, nor shall you covet your neighbor's wife or his male or servant or manservant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. God gave the people of Israel these 10 simple commands to follow. And after receiving them, collectively as a body, they all agreed to follow them, to abide by them, to live their lives in accordance to these rules. And then all of a sudden, human nature kicked in. The inevitable <clears throat> took over. The question of what if reared its ugly head, taking us to the litigious part of our journey, the part that became all legalistic. At this point, as they began to question, under what conditions must I not do this, or under what conditions what if this happens? Can't I do that? Or if this happens? And so as they continued to question the Ten Commandments and dig deeper and find other ways to justify not having to do parts of it or all of it or some of it, God then turned around and said, OK, we're going to answer the what if questions. And as you continue this journey of the people of Israel through the journey in the Old Testament, we have an entire section that's dedicated that reads more like a law journal than it does a book of guidance and inspiration. That journey continued on. 
the debates continued on, the what if questions continued on all the way to where we are today in our scripture, in our gospel reading, and the point when Jesus says, enough is enough. Here's how you hear these 10 commandments. He took the first four and he grouped them into one simple phrase. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul, period. And then he took the next six and he grouped them into one clear, concise statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then to finish that thought, he said, and if you have any questions, any doubts, any confusion, any other things that come in, any other decisions you have to make, let these two commandments be the guide how you understand and interpret every action that you do after this point. That's what it means by saying, hang all these on the laws and prophets. And though these two commandments seem straightforward, though these two commandments seem pretty self-explanatory, the what if question still found its way back into the conversation. So in response to the what if question, we turn our attentions back to our reading from the book of Leviticus and it says, look, I told you what to do, but for whatever reason, we don't hear the what to do, so let me tell you what not to do, and maybe that'll help to make it clearer. And so we read once again, it says, do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor and favoritism to those who are great and rich. Judge your neighbor fairly. Do not spread slander amongst your people. Do not do anything that would endanger your neighbor's life. Do not hesitate, I'm sorry, do not hate your fellow Israelite in your heart. And if your neighbor does something you don't like, bring it to their attention. Talk to them about it. Pray with them about it so that you won't share their guilt by encouraging bad behavior to continue. Do not seek revenge or bear grudges against anyone, but love your neighbor as yourself. Beloved people of God, though this journey that we just took with the people of Israel was meant for the people of Israel, God gave us a blessed opportunity to hear it, to walk alongside them, and to learn. To learn from their journey how life can be when we fall away from God, when we don't follow what God expects of us to do. God has given us this teachable moment so that we will know what it means to live in harmony with our fellow human being. But it also shows how difficult life can be when we choose to live our lives with anger or bitterness or prejudice in our hearts against our fellow human being or against those who come around us. Living into the commandment to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, and soul means that you have decided made a conscious effort to allow God to be that central focus in your life. It means that you have accepted the fact that you are going to do whatever it takes to live a life that's truly pleasing to God. And for those who are sitting with the what if question, even after hearing all of this, Here's how I respond to the what if questions that may come even today. For the first one, when it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, 
in response to that what if question, it says that if you think about doing something that you may feel a little uncomfortable saying or doing if God were standing right next to you, then you should probably consider doing something else. And then the second one, the more difficult one, the one that challenges everybody in this room without exception at one time or another, and that is the loving your neighbor the way that you love yourself. Well, here's how we can determine if we're doing that right. First, this is one that I've always enjoyed, the golden rule. Who knows the golden rule? Raise your hand. On the count of three, shout it out. What is the golden rule? Do unto others as you will have them do unto you. Rule number one, if you don't want somebody to do it to you, if you don't appreciate somebody doing something to you, then don't do it to somebody else. Plain and simple. Can't get any more simpler than that. And then there's the second one. We drag God back into this one. And the second one is this. If you are about to say or do something to another person, imagine if God were standing right next to them. If you don't feel comfortable saying what you were going to say to that person or doing what you were going to do to that person in the presence of God, you should probably reconsider doing it. Beloved people of God, this may sound like a lot. It may sound hard. It may sound difficult. But it's not. If we truly accept the fact that we are going to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength, what you will discover is that the love that you will have for your fellow human being, the love that you will have for your neighbor, will come naturally. And what you'll discover is that those two laws cannot be separated. They come hand in hand. One will not exist without the other. And so, beloved people of God, I pray that you will accept this challenge as your rule, as your guide, as your inspiration, as the way you will live your lives, to love God and love your neighbor. Love your neighbor because you love God and love God by showing that love towards your fellow human being. Amen? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for reminding us of that simple rule that we exist because of your love and your love alone. And so, Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.